Ojuku run away and left these poor people that he has led into such uh, you know, suffering, such uh, uh, in, abject, in a position, just left them. And now probably because with the money he has amassed outside, I suppose that he will go and live in, uh, you know, in, uh, in joy and plenty. Well, I hope he will enjoy the rest of his life. I hope his conscience will, uh, uh, you know, will allow him to rest. God knows. If at all, if I'm in, uh, those who are supporting Ojuku, allow him to really get away with what he has done to his people, to Nigeria, to Africa, then I think they need to examine their conscience. And honestly, I have got no faith in such people. Imagine being the son of a Nigerian billionaire knighted by the Queen of England. Imagine growing up in a mansion and attending a private high school in the best connected destinations in London where you set a school record for the best discus throw. Imagine being a student at the University of Oxford playing on the rugby team where you are famous for your flashy clothes and your red sports car. Then suddenly, after graduating with honors from the university, you will buff your father's offer to join your family's multi-billion dollar business. Instead, you enroll in the civil service of a third world country where you work on community projects building roads and digging culverts. Then, later on, you join the military, partly to spite your father because you sense that the country where you live in is headed for an upheaval and that the army of that country is the place to be when that time comes. This is the story of one of the most controversial figures in contemporary Nigerian history. His name is Lieutenant Colonel Chukwe Mecca Umegu Ujuku. Chukwe Emeka Emeka Udumegu Ojuku was born on the 4th of November 1933 in Zugiru in northern Nigeria to Sir Louis Udumegu Ojuku, an Igbo businessman from present day Newi Anambra State in southeastern Nigeria. Sir Louis was in the transport business. He took advantage of the business boom during World War II to become the richest man in Nigeria at the time. Chukwe Mecca began his educational career in Lagos, southwestern Nigeria, which explains why Ojuku Jr. would speak Hausa and Yoruba languages fluently. Emeka Ojuku started his secondary school education at CMS Grammar School, Lagos, aged 10, in 1943. He later transferred to King's College, Lagos, in 1944, where he was involved in a controversy leading to his brief imprisonment for assaulting a British teacher who put down a student strike action that he was a part of. This event generated widespread coverage in local newspapers. At 13, his father sent him to the United Kingdom to continue his education. 
first at Ipsum College and later at Lincoln College, Oxford University, where he earned a master's degree in history. He returned to colonial Nigeria in 1956. Ujuku joined the civil service in eastern Nigeria as an administrative officer in present-day Enugu state. In 1957, after two years of working with the colonial civil service and seeking to break away from his father's influence over his civil service career, he left and joined the military, initially enlisting as a non-commissioned officer NCO in Zaria. Ujuku's decision to enlist as an NCO was forced by his father's pulling of political strings with the then Governor General of Nigeria, John McPherson, to prevent Emeka from getting an officer cadetship. Sir Louis and Governor General McPherson believed Emeka would not stick to the grueling NCO schedule. However, Emeka persevered. After an incident in which Ujuku corrected a drill surgeon's mispronunciation of the safety catch of the Lee Enfield 303 rifle, the British depot commander recommended Emeka for an officer's commission. I think that when it does come, well, the people on the other side would be surprised as to what they're going to get. From Zaria, Mecca proceeded first to the Royal West African Frontier Force Training School in Ghana and next to Eton Hall where he received his commission in March 1958 as second lieutenant. He was one of the first and few university graduates to receive an army commission. He later attended infantry school in Warminster. Upon completion of further military training, he was assigned to the army's 5th battalion in Aduna. At that time, the Nigerian military forces had 250 officers and only 15 were Nigerians. There were 6,400 other ranks, of which 336 were British. Lieutenant Colonel Ojuku was in Kano, Northern Nigeria, when Major Patrick Chukuma Aduna, on 15th January 1966, executed and announced a bloody military coup in Kaduna, also in Northern Nigeria. It is to Ojuku's credit that the coup lost much steam in the north, where it had succeeded. Lieutenant Colonel Udumegu Ojuku supported the forces loyal to the Supreme Commander of the Nigerian Armed Forces, Major General Agui Erosi. Major Nzegu was in control of Kaduna, but the coup had failed in other parts of the country. Agui Eronsi took over the leadership of the country and thus became the first military head of state. Monday 17th January 1966, he appointed military governors for the four regions. Lieutenant Colonel Udumegu Ujuku was appointed military governor of the eastern region. Others were Lieutenant Colonel Hassan Usman Katsina for the north, Francis Adekunle Fajui for the west, and David Apude Ejo for the midwest. These men formed the Supreme Military Council with Brigadier B.A.O. Ogundigwe, Chief of Staff, Supreme Headquarters, Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowan, Chief of Staff, Army Headquarters, Commodore J.E.A. Ware, 
head of Nigerian Navy, Lieutenant Colonel George T. Urubo, head of Air Force, and Colonel Shitu Alawo. By the 29th of May, the 1966 anti-Ibo pogrom started. This presented problems for Urubo as he did everything in his power to prevent reprisals and even encouraged people to return as assurances for their safety had been given by his supposed colleagues up north and out west. On 29 July 1966, a group of officers including Majors Murtala Mohammed, Theophilus Yakub Danjuma and Martin Adamu led the majority of northern soldiers in the mutiny and later developed into a counter-coup or July rematch. The coup failed in the southeastern part of Nigeria where Ujuku was the military governor due to the effort of the brigade commander and hesitation of northern officers stationed in the region, partly due to the mutiny leaders in the east being northern whilst being surrounded by a large eastern population. The Supreme Commander General Aguye Rossi and his host Colonel Fadri were abducted and killed in Ibadan. On acknowledging Aguye's death, Ujuku insisted that the military hierarchy be preserved. The most senior army officer after Aguye was Brigadier Baba Femi Ogudigbe. However, the leaders of the counter-coup insisted that Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowan be made head of state, although both Gowan and Ujugu were of the same rank in the Nigerian army. Ogudikwe could not muster enough force in Lagos to establish his authority as soldiers available to him were under Joseph Garba, who was part of the coup. This realization led Ogundigwe to opt out. Thus, Ojuku's insistence could not be enforced by Ogundigwe unless the coup plotters agreed, which they did not. The fallout from this led to a standoff between Ojuku and Gowan, leading to the sequence of events that resulted in the Nigerian Civil War. In January 1967, the Nigerian military leadership went to Aburi, Ghana for a peace conference hosted by General Joseph Ankara. The implementation of the agreements reached by Aburi fell apart upon the leadership's return to Nigeria and on 30th May 1967, as a result of this, Colonel Udumegu Juku declared Eastern Nigeria a sovereign state to be known as Yafra. On the 6th of July 1967, Gowan declared war and attacked Biafra. In addition to the Aburi Accord that tried to avoid the war, that might be regarded as prejudicial to the peace talks now going on in Kampala. Uganda. There was also the Niami Peace Conference under President Hamani Diori and the OAU-sponsored Addis Ababa Conference under the chairmanship of President Hali Selassie. This was the final effort by Generals Ujuku and Gowan to settle the conflict via diplomacy. Fatherland. I'm satisfied that all other Nigerians have learned the lesson of our most recent history and the current civil war. And I pray to God that there will never be a repetition. Surely in my destination. 
And so, as far as this war continues, we'll fight to the last man. During the war in 1967, many members of the July 1966 alleged coup plot and Major Victor Banjo were executed for treason with the approval of Ujugu, the Biafran Supreme Commander. Major Ifejuna was one of those executed. The defendants had argued that they sought a negotiated ceasefire with the federal government and were not guilty of treason. We have made all attempts at a democratic resolution of this crisis. I have offered open elections, plebiscite. I have offered just an open carte blanche suggestion anybody who can find a democratic way of finding out the wishes of the people, let him suggest it and we will go for it. After two and a half years of fighting and starvation, a hole appeared in the Biafran front lines and the Nigerian military exploited this. As it became obvious that the war was lost, Ojuku was convinced to leave the country to avoid assassination. On the 9th of January 1970, he handed over power to his second in command, Chief of General Staff Major General Philip Effion. But we have Colonel Obasanjo, who is the commander of three Marine Commando, who have been able to capture a number of senior secessionist officers, and he had brought them to Lagos. Formally give up secession and report for reappointment and redeployment. Excellency. Oh, Good to see you again. My pleasure. How are you? Very well indeed. Good to see you again. Thank you. Patrick Amadi. How are you? Excellent. Glad to see you again. Thank you very much. Glad to see you again. Salam Honestly. Glad to see you again. And I would like, therefore, to take this opportunity to say that I, Major General Philip Ethion, officer administ administering the government of the Republic of Biafra, now wish to make the following declaration. That we affirm we are loyal Nigerian citizens and accept the authority of the Federal Military Government of Nigeria that the Republic of Biafra hereby ceases to exist. And left for Ivory Coast where President Felix Ufebwani, who had recognized Biafra on 14th May 1968, granted him political asylum. The so-called rising sun of Biafra is set forever. It will be a great disservice for anyone to continue to use the word Biafra to refer to any part of the east central state of Nigeria. The tragic chapter of violence is just ended. We are at the dawn of national reconciliation. Once again, we have an opportunity to build a new nation. You will have heard that my government may seek the assistance of friendly foreign governments and bodies, especially in the provision of equipment to supplement our national effort. There are, however, a number of foreign governments and organizations whose so-called assistance will not be welcome. These are the governments and organizations which sustained the rebellion. They are thus guilty of the blood of thousands who perished because of the prolongation 
of the futile rebel, rebel uh, resistance. They did not act out of love for humanity. Their purpose was to disintegrate Nigeria and Africa and impose their will on us.